You're listening to the Potaholics Comedy Network. Potaholics.com. Welcome to Codex, a brief history of video games. Emphasis on the brief. <laughs> Brief. We are not doing a boxer history. <laughs> no, we are not. We're not going to get super historian on it. I'm Mike Coletta. And I'm Tyler Osby. And it, this is our podcast about the history of video games. Mm-hmm. And for episode one, first of all, we should mention that we are using a book mm-hmm. to go through this entire first series of the podcast. We get a little British on it. You know yeah. what I mean? A little series. A little series. We're doing a kind of a, a book club sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the book we're using is The Ultimate History of Video Games by Stephen L. Kent. It's so a great book. So I strongly far. suggest it's a great book. I strongly suggest you pick it up on Amazon and you can get it for five dollars on Kindle, mm-hmm. if I believe so. That's true. Tyler, that's true. Uh, and that's the one we're using. And the first episode today we're going to start by talking about pinball and novelty games. Why do we need to talk about pinball, Mike? I thought this was about video games. Well, pinball is kind of the precursor to video games. And if we want to go back to where it all began, we got to start there. You know, the, the analogy they use in the book is originally they called cars horseless carriages. Because, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you had to start describing it by something people already knew. That's right. And so pinball is like the precursor to video games. It's an amusement game. Mm-hmm. It's where it all started before arcades and all that jazz. Uh, so we're going to start there. And uh, I think when I edit this, I'm going to cue a little French music in the background right now. Because we are starting oh, sounds great, Mike. in late. And if I didn't do it, then that people will know how lazy I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to start in late 1600 France with King Louis XIV at the Chateau de Bagatelle with a game called Bagatelle. Oh, wow. So yeah. descriptive. I know, right? Very, very. They just name stuff about where it starts. <laughs> What's Bagatelle? Um, Bagatelle is a game where you, a player would take a pool cue and shoot an ivory ball up a thin sloped billiard table and the ball would try they try to get the balls into holes and avoid knocking over wooden pins. So kind of like ski ball but with like extra obstacles. Yeah, it's like ski ball and bowling mixed together and kind pool. of and pool. Yeah, okay. it makes sense. It's a perfect way to put it. Yeah. And uh, and eventually what happened was the pins took too long to reset, so they just stuck the pins to the table and they just became stationary pins that you'd actually use to bounce the ball off of to hit better shots. Okay. And this game was a big hit all over Europe and America. And there's even a political cartoon in 1864 where Abraham Lincoln plays uh, against his Democratic challenger George McClellan in a game of Bagatelle. Did he win? I, I, they, don't, they don't say who wins. It's mm. just they're just squaring off in it. I guess whoever won the election is who won. So as far as I know, Abraham Lincoln won Bagatelle. Yeah, that's for that's, sure. That's... I remember it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's exactly how I remember it. Uh, And the next big thing that happened to Bagatelle that made it closer to pinball is in 1871 when an English inventor named Montague Redgrave. Whoa. That's a good name. That is a great name. That's like a name that's like, hey, this guy is going to be a hit at parties. That's two last names. That's like Anderson Cooper. That is two last names. You're right. Anderson Cooper. I never thought of it that way. Later, we're going to have a two first name guy. So the the good last name guy is good. He moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, and he filed a patent for a ball shooting device that was a steel spring and plunger to propel the ball forward. And this is where it started, the pinball plunger that everyone knows and loves. Mm -hmm. This is where it began uh, because they didn't want to use the the pool cue anymore. Yeah. And he also was the one that added obstacles for the ball to hit on the way back down the table. Okay. And if the ball hit, a bell would go off. Sound a little familiar? We're getting a little closer. We're getting there, yeah. We're doing it to it. Mm Mm-hmm. And you want to go? You want to talk about David Gottlieb? Well, David Gottlieb, this guy is the Tony Stark of pinball. He's true. They say Henry Ford in the book, which I liked, but Tony Stark is, I feel like, more of a nerdy reference for us yeah, that we need. That's pretty good. Um, he created a game called Baffle Ball, uh, which where the point was to like launch the ball and then sort of tilt the table to do yeah. to like to do stuff with it. Um, that got really popular. At one point, he was shipping four hundred units a day. 400 units of baffle ball. Of baffle ball to uh, bars and which, places by the way, all over. This was like in the early 1900s. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I think this is this was kind of taking place around, yeah, around 1930s, 1920s kind of era. Mm-hmm. And 
he was actually like 400 units a day is a lot. Yeah. I feel like for back then. And this game was like bars. This right. game was about like playing it in bars against your friends for fun while drinking. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and the, the the game was actually, it's kind of weird that they sold that many a day because there was a lot of competitors back then. But this guy was the guy who did it first and Baffle Ball had like this name and they sold the, the actual game for $1.50 more than its nearest competitor. But it was worth it. It was so it's, good. Yeah. The, the, the David Gottlieb's grandson in the book says it was the Cadillac of pinball. Wow. I like that. The Cadillac of pinball. The Cadillac of pinball. Uh, another honorable mention is Ray Maloney. He invented the game Ballyhoo that was so popular he renamed his company Lion Manufacturing to Bally, which you should recognize because it's a very popular pinball company mm-hmm. up until about the 1980s. And then the next guy, Tyler. Harry Williams. That's right. This is our two first namer. Her- <laughs> Harry Williams. He's got two first names. He would take these all these different kinds of games, the Baffle Balls, the Ballyhoos, or whatever, and he would reskin them to be like his own games. And he made a bunch of money doing that. But what he really did was he created a thing called the stool pigeon. It was like a tilt mechanism. So it was like a, a detector for when somebody was tilting a table. Because by this time, a lot of the games, so Baffle Ball was all about tilting a table. Other things were not about tilting the table, but if you did tilt the table, you could give yourself an advantage. So it was this thing was about making sure that we uh, correctly detected the cheats, the right cheats. That's I guess. right. Yeah, because also the reason they dete- they put this in there and uh, was the the gambling thing. Yeah, because this biz- pinball became payout machines, which were gambling versions of pinball. And this was created so that way you couldn't tilt the gambling machines and try to win more money. Mm-hmm. Uh, Harry Williams also was credited in 1933 with the first electric pinball machine called Contact. Mm. And then they added a battery to another machine in 1934, and this had an automatic scoring system mm. in the form of a clock counter, which I don't know what that means. My guess is it's like when you have that long line of numbers and each digit has like a rotating wheel that has yeah. one through zero on it. Not like a digital readout. Yeah, but, but a... like it would go up kind of like an old cash register. I think yeah. it was like that. Mm-hmm. Is we, I'm, I'm guessing. I mean, this is... We're not historians. Yeah, well, we were, well, you know... Trying to be. Trying to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Great Depression was actually a really popular time for pinball. So you think it would go down, but it was cheap entertainment, so people enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You drop your penny or your nickel in, you get a lot of you get a lot of fun. Yeah, I think they said for was it? I think it was Baffle Ball. It was like a penny got you seven balls. That's a lot. That's a lot of that's for a lot penny. of yeah, a lot for a penny. I like that. All right, payout machines. Payout machines. This is super big. This is like the big thing about pinball. Pinball was banned uh, in New York first mm-hmm. because of their mayor, mm-hmm. and his name was Fiorello Laguardia, which mm-hmm. Laguardia Airport. Named after him? I think that's what you you said it. La- I was I was surprised. I think I you're right. I'm making that up. I was making that up, but it sounds right. I don't know anyone else with the last name Laguardia. No, you know we could Google it. Maybe we'll do I'm a. Gonna, you're gonna, gonna Google, Google it right LaGuardia now. Airport All right, anyway. I'll keep talking about uh, Mayor Laguardia, and he was the one in 1942. He got it banned, and he ordered police to smash these with sledgehammers, and he threw p- bits of them in the river as like a publicity stunt to be like. This game is ruining our children. Mm. Uh, and the quote he had, which I really enjoyed, was this game, pinball machines rob the pockets of school children in the form of nickels and dimes given to them as lunch money, end quote. So it was like he thought they were bullies. Just, just pinball machines were just beating kids up, taking, taking their, their money. money. <laughs> oh. uh, my Google says, yes, it was. It was? It was named after the Maria. Dude, what a good hunch. That's the natural historic instinct that Tyler has yeah. right there. You know, you can't teach that. And so the ban was in New York was from 1942 to 1976. And it was lifted because of the invention of flippers. Mm, why were flippers significant? Because until that time, you would launch the ball up and it would just fall wherever it went. It was a game of chance, but flippers turned pinball into a game of skill. Mm. Isn't that neat? So once it be- once it becomes a game of skill, then it's actually okay to do payouts. Yeah. Because you're not gambling, you're you're testing your you're skill. You're testing your skill and it's not by chance. And so and this is the quote I have and it's it's the story of how they overturned the New York City pinball ban. And this is from a website called BMI Gaming mm-hmm. and this is the only non book source i'm really using they had a really great like the whole history of pinball article 
highly recommend you read it. Hmm. Uh, but it, this is the quote. Here we go. Quote, in 1976, the New York City pinball ban was overturned at a city council meeting, due in part to the lobbying efforts of the coin-op amusement industry by proving to the council that pinball was really a game of skill and not chance, and therefore should be legalized. They demonstrated their point in a very unique fashion by employing the talents of a young magazine editor named Roger Sharp, who was the best player in the area. As the pinball machines lay in front of the council and surrounded by hordes of journalists and photographers, Sharp proceeded to play and told the council that based on only his skill, he would be able to get the ball to land through the middle lane on the play field. And just after completing this historic shot, the city council then voted to overturn the pinball machine ban for good. Wow. End quote. It's yeah. a... Yeah. What if he missed? What if he missed? <laughs> that's the biggest thing. That's the number one question I always think of. Is like, what if he missed? And then he just took pinball back a hundred years, <laughs> and there would be no video games, and nothing would happen. That's we it. owe everything to Roger Sharp. Roger Sharp, thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Roger Sharp. And also, like his story, it's got to be like a movie. Yeah, it's got to be. You think he was nervous when he had all these people around? He's like. Heart beating, yeah, hands shaking. but then he was so good, he's so confident, you know. It's yeah. like he knows he's gonna nail the shot, mm-hmm. you know. That's I feel like it's a made for TV movie, though. It's definitely not gonna be a theatrical release, yeah. No offense, Roger, but like you're gonna be like Brink or something, you know, <laughs> or a Lifetime Nickelodeon or Lifetime, depending on the way they go with it. The Pirates of Silicon Valley, <laughs> I like it, I like it a lot. We could, we should just write that script, Tyler. You and me, we could do well, it. Pirates of Silicon Valley is a real movie. Oh really? Yeah, it's great. Well, I mean, I mean, I, well, I mean, the New York pin- oh, the pinball yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. I think we could do that for sure. Um, the next one that I thought was interesting is like California's reason why they lifted the pinball ban. Why did California lift a pinball ban? California lifted the pinball ban, and this is this is my favorite quote I found um, in the whole thing. And this is actually from the court documents that in after the case, like the judges, like. Uh, what you gonna call it? Wow, the name is gone. Um, argument. I don't mm-hmm. know. Closing argument. I mm-hmm. guess that the judge made. Um, Closing. Oh, remarks. Opinion, it's, yeah, remarks. Opinion. I think because okay. it's a dissenting opinion and dissenting opinion. Okay. Uh, pinball machines provide wholesome amusement for their patrons, and a constitutional right exists in the exercise of a wholesome amusement and it's in its purveyance. Should the ordinance be construed to prescribe the maintenance in public places of coin-operated mechanical devices for playing games, predominantly of skill? It would violate the due process and equal protection clauses of the 14th Amendment, as well as the right to the pursuit of happiness protected by Article 1, Section 1 of the California Constitution, end quote. Wow, that's a pretty good defense for anything. Yeah, right? It's like, yeah, the, you have the right to be happy, according to the Constitution, and if pinball makes you happy, you got to play this game. <laughs> <laughs> you got to follow your dreams, play pinball. That's right. Every kid playing Minecraft right now should write that down the next time your parents try to make you not play pursuit that anymore. Happiness. This is making me happy, and it's creative. What know? if my what if the thing that makes me happy is like robbing people? Then you know what? If it makes you happy, it can't be that bad. Who said that? Atlantis? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Atlantis. I don't know, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I wrote. You can't outlaw fun, is what they're saying. Wow. And fun is a constitutional right. Now, fun is a constitutional right. Here's the big thing about the pinball ban, Tyler. Mm-hmm. Is when do you think? What, what what was the last the last city I'll say it this way the last city to lift their pinball ban was Kokomo Indiana what year do you think that was in nineteen well if it's a trivia thing then it must be later than I think mm-hmm. I'm gonna say like nineteen eighty six two thousand sixteen <laughs> Kokomo Indiana huh. ended their pinball ban in two thousand sixteen two years ago were they. Were they enforcing that recently? I don't know. I what I really want if anyone here is from Kokomo, Indiana, or has been there prior to 2016 and tried to play pinball and was roughed up and thrown <laughs> out of a bar. Let me know. Is there, is there like an underground <laughs> pinball scene that it's like, was in yeah, Indiana? They treat it like drugs. They're like, yeah. "Do you have any pinball? Get you out of here! <laughs> what are you doing?" <laughs> um, other things that I thought we should mention now, after we've done the pinball mm-hmm. ban, that's over. Let's go a little bit more into flippers. Yeah. Does that sound good to you? Because mm-hmm. flippers, I mean, one, magical dolphin, two, a very, 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 very good thing. Uh, flippers is what made it so the game wasn't gambling anymore. And the first person to come up with flippers was Harry Mabs, and he had six flippers in his game. <laughs> Mike here, quick note to the squad. This is where the flipper joke ends, because otherwise it would become unbearable. 
That sounds like a lot. The of first game, six flippers. Wow. Yeah, and it was called Humpty. It was Humpty Dumpty was the name of the game, and it was actually, I believe, it was a Gottlieb and Company game. Hmm. Yeah, and it was a six flipper game, and it's 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 right. It's a lot. I also don't know if it was like you press one button and all three flippers on the right side go off, and yeah. you press because it was top, middle, bottom flippers on both sides. I feel like it has to be. Yeah, They're I mean, there's there six different buttons. That would be crazy. Yeah. Like, you have to do, like, crazy-ass combos on that thing. That'd be nuts. Steven Kordek, he was the one that made a game called Triple Action, and he, in an effort to save money, put two flippers at the bottom, on the left and the right. And that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. and that's it. That's the way it's been, because he was the one that, he made that up to make money by the bottom flippers, and everyone else just kept going yep. with that, because it was such a good setup. Sometimes if you just remove stuff, it's still fun. It makes it cheaper, you that's know? That's right, you know? And also that right, um... That right. Sometimes now you have that right flipper, that right top flipper, though. Yeah, I but like it's, it's hooked up to the right. Yeah, yeah, I like that one. I like when it has that little top flipper and you can kind of get a, a little, little extra skill. Yeah, a little extra something, something. Yeah. You know? Too bad they don't do payout pinball machines anymore. I know, right? You're, I, I'm awful at pinball. Same. So we're both pretty bad at it. Yeah. But we love it. Yeah, I played a lot of Space Cadet pinball. Yes. Space Cadet. I was going to mention that later because <laughs> I love it so much. I was the first game that was on my uh, Windows 95 computer was Space yep. Cadet pinball. It's a good one. When I got that Gateway Cow Box. Yeah, you know Gateway I mean? 2000. Yeah, yeah. there yeah. it is. I remember it came built into Windows XP, but it was on older systems before that. Yeah, I think yeah. it was. Was it then? Yeah, I think it was. On, it was some on old family computer I played it. But yeah, Space Cadet Pinball yeah. was the best. Yeah, it was great. Big fan of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Other fun pinball facts. Harry Williams, as mentioned before, and Ballyhoo, the, and Bally, the guy that made Ballyhoo, mm-hmm. Roy Williams. Or no, Roy, uh, what was his name? I was really, I just lost it. Ray, Mal- Ray Maloney. Ray Maloney. Ray Maloney and Harry Williams formed Williams and Bally. They combined together. And they are credited with the most mass produced pinball machine ever, which is the Adams Family pinball machine. And they made over 20,000 units of that machine. Wow. You can think about how big a pinball machine is. It's pretty, it's a lot. It's pretty big. And also, there's not that many places to get them in. Like, how many bars are there in the country, you know? Yeah, that's like, <laughs> yeah, this, well, I mean. This is America, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> but yeah, I, I agree. No, there is like, yeah, that's a lot of, there's a lot of unions probably sitting in a warehouse somewhere just waiting. Yep. You know? Waiting to be restored. Mm-hmm. We got to get that. We got to get one of those Adams Family units. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. Uh, as also, here's something interesting I found. Uh, Gary Stern, he invented the Stern Pinball Company. Why so serious? And he was actually one of the last big pinball companies because Williams and Bally went out of business. Hmm. And he is one that like kind of stayed around, and he was the only in two as of two thousand two he was the only really big company left was Stern Pinball, and his dad made Stern Electronics, which is a video game arcade company. Mm-hmm. So they're the weird thing where it was like video games first and then pinball. He jumped in that later, hmm. but this fact I thought was cool, and that is out of the pinball machines they sell to businesses or arcades, like right as of like they used to sell only to those companies, but as of two thousand eight. And according to that BMI gaming article, thirty-five to sixty percent of Stern sales are home sales. Like people buy them to put in their own yeah. collections at home. Yeah, like no one's buying them for bars anymore. They're being bought to be put in your house, which is cool because who doesn't want a pinball machine in your house? I would totally have a pinball That's machine. It's amazing because yeah. all those noises it makes, the dog would go nuts. Yeah, but it no. would be it would be good. I mean, she already goes nuts anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I haven't seen a pinball machine like in a in a place like a bar or whatever in a long time like there are some places like if you go to a barcade usually they've got yeah. a pinball machine but like it doesn't seem to be like a, a thing like a normal thing you know what i associate with pinball machines mm. is like a nice mom and pop pizza restaurant yeah like one where you would like get done playing little league or something and go do, go yep. to like that was you go to like abby's pizza yeah, yeah abby's pizza or uh for when I was in uh, Eagle River, Alaska, it was Pizza Pizza Man was pizza that man. place. Yeah, oh. my chess club was there too. A lot of stuff going on at the Pizza Man. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I um, I just thought that was an interesting fact about pinball being for home now. But it, it makes sense because people now like it's like kind of a thing of people like kids past now adults. Yeah. So it's like we want you were, this stuff from our past. If you were super into it and you wanted to be really good at pinball, you would get one for your home. Yeah, for now, sure. Now, you wouldn't go to... It's like in that uh, movie, The King of Kong, when the guy in Bellevue, Washington, wanted to get really good at uh, Donkey Kong 
Junior, I think, yeah. was he got the machine in his house. And yeah, he, like, played it all the time, and it, you can't you can't spend quarters to get good at it. You no. got to buy that machine. You got to commit to That's it. That's right. You're talking about Steve Weeby? Yeah, Steve yeah. Weeby. I love that documentary. We might have to talk about yeah. that documentary. That's a great what, documentary. One one episode. Maybe we could do that. Uh, just, we could just talk about that. Just talk about King of Kong. Oh, I love it so much. Yeah. I also love any of the stuff about. Um, what is it? Galaxies, Twin Galaxies. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. any of this about the arcade. Place. I know somebody who used to work at Twin Galaxies. What? Yeah. Dude, we don't talk get, about this. We get him on the show. We can get him on the show. I love that. I was whispering. I'm so excited. Yeah. Now, as far as pinballs go, it's kind of been taken over by the whole. I guess I, I don't. I guess I would call it Etsy culture, but it's always been around of people mm-hmm. like building their own stuff and oh, selling yeah. them online, or like, restoring them, or restoring pinball machines. It's very popular to build your own pinball machine. In your home, if you're into that, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean. It's got cool stuff now with all the new technology and yeah. LCDs and stuff like that. But you know, get all hooked up to like a Raspberry Pi. Oh, yeah, Splatoon. I like that. Yeah, dude, the Raspberry Pi, very, very influential computer. Yeah, to do a lot of stuff. 35 bucks, 35 dollars for a computer to do basic stuff. Mm-hmm. I like it, I like it a lot. That was pinball. So that's all about pinball. Why? Mm-hmm. So, why is pinball important then, too, when we talk about video games? I why think is it's it important because to start there? To get to, I mean, pinball and novelty games, which we should also mention briefly, are like your shooting galleries. Mm-hmm. Your, any game now that you see at Chuck E. Cheese for tickets, <laughs> that's pretty much, or like a Cabela's when you walk yeah. in and there's like the giant shooting gallery. <laughs> Those, I mean, well, I mean, the for novelty games, it's simple, like a shooting gallery game, like just put it electronic on your TV and you got Duck Hunt. Like yeah. it's, this is what started it all because it became it was pinball first in bars and then it was arcade games in bars and arcade cabinets. Mm-hmm. And so that's why it's just a natural progression. And yeah. I mean, we could have skipped straight to video games, which we're about to talk about in like two seconds. But I felt like we get to give a little more context. Right. That's like all. that's like the prehistory because the kinds of things that video games did at the start, at least with like arcade games and stuff were sort of to fill that same niche that things like pinball exactly. did. Like something to stand around at a mm-hmm. bar the and home, hang with your friends. Yeah, the home video game system yeah. wasn't like like thought of well, it was thought of early. Yeah, they sort of and, came and up together but but where they got popular was arcades. Was arcades. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So and now like we're gonna talk about MIT. MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And the Tech Model Radio Club. Ra- Railroad Club. Railroad Club. Yep. Railroad Radio Club. Tech Model ra- Railroad Club. They probably were into radios, too. I mean, yeah, these I guys mean, were engineers. They were into everything. Like, if it had mm-hmm. an electronic circuit in it, they, they were would, all about it. And the best part about these guys is they just seem like they just love to tinker. And yeah. they had their own language, too, the Tech Model Railroad Club did. It was like lead speak early. I think, like, trudge and culge and weird, like, terms yeah. like that. Hacks. Hacks. That's they were the, the ones that came up with hack. Yep. Yeah. If you did something in a weird way, kind of like if you had like jury rigged it or something and you hacked it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, we looked up the difference between jury rig and jerry rig. Can yeah. we go over that real quick? Yeah, okay. So the difference between jury rig and jerry rig. Um, so jury rig is a nautical term uh, for something that has been sort of cobbled together. Like if you lost something overboard, you would you need a replacement for it because you're out on the water. Mm-hmm. So if you jury rig something... That's like a, it's jury nautical. Mean, jury means something nautical and then like a rig in nautical terms, mm-hmm. right? So they so sort of naturally come together. Jerry rig is different because uh, jerry rig actually comes from something being like jerry built, which oh. is sort of, it's sort of similar, but jury rig has like a very specific nautical connotation with it of like, we're hacking this thing together to, uh, to like replace something that we lost overboard. Whereas jerry rigging, or Jerry building something is like, I just built this thing and it's terrible. <laughs> I built this thing and I'm not very good at it. Yeah, and I'm yeah. not very good at it. And so people say Jerry rig now because it's like a combination of those two things. But it really, it's jury rig. Jury rig. Yeah. For. So they were into jury rigged stuff. Yeah. Uh, they were engineers that were interested in computers and they had multiple computer options in the beginning, mm-hmm. right? They had the IBM 709, also known as the Hulking Giant. And because they, it was. It was gigantic. Yeah. And they ignored it because it was so popular among other students. They didn't want to mess with it. They mm-hmm. wanted something for themselves. And because of that, they chose the tic- Texo. T-X-O. Tixo. Tixo is yeah. what they call it. Uh, it was smaller and cheaper, and it had transistors. Yeah, you get, can get rid of a lot of vacuum tubes if yeah, you're that's using right. transistors. Um, that doesn't mean it didn't have vacuum tubes. And the, the thing about vacuum tubes is they're, they're so hot. They require yeah. tons, literal tons of air conditioning this, to keep them cool. Yeah, the Tixo had 15 tons of air conditioning, and it was actually developed as a military computer. 
Oh. So I had military. I don't know what that would be. Like maybe or calculating like, missile. Yeah, stuff or like something. that. Yeah, you know, yeah. science stuff, math stuff. Yep. But they use the the Tixo, which is it's a TXO, but they call it the Tixo, and I want to feel like I'm in the yeah. Tech Model Railroad Club, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually, from Digital Equipment, that's the company. Digital, they got the PDP One, which stands for Programmable Data Processor One. Okay. And it was the size of a large automobile downsizing you know uh-huh. making it a little more functional so it was a little uh, bit more portable yeah it was a hundred and twenty thousand dollars is how much it cost which i think today we calculated as being like around nine hundred eighty nine hundred eighty thousand dollars in, in, in today's, today's money 18 money yeah. yeah um and this and this was in 1961 is when they used this computer to make a game steve russell created the game and he created Space space War you know, right. as an exclamation point at the end. Space War! It's Space War! Uh, he invented Space War, and it took him six months and 200 hours to complete this game. And we wow. YouTubed it. And let me tell you what, it doesn't look like it's six months and 200 it hours. It doesn't look like much. <laughs> yeah. But, but those computers were so hard to program for back in the day because you would have to like type in, you, you had to work on a machine level. And they would print scripts, yeah, too. Yeah, like you had to print things out and... It was crazy. Yeah, it was a, a lot of trial and error, a lot of like hunting things down to like figure out what's wrong with the thing. So the fact that you're able to do anything like that mm-hmm. at all is actually really impressive. Yeah, Steve. What I'm saying is I'm not trying to poo-poo on you, Steve Russell. You're great. Never change. You're the best. <laughs> but yeah, Space War, because uh, I think it was kind of interesting because he said the whole thing about this tech model railroad club is they were trying to outdo each other, like impress each other. Mm -hmm. And this was his idea was I'm going to make a video game about dueling rocket ships in space. And everyone's like, okay, yeah, sure. And then he made it, which they then made it. He, after Steve Russell made it, the rest of them improved upon it. And mm-hmm. how did they improve upon it? Tyler? The, they would like they would just go in and add other stuff. Like they had a, a projection, like a map of the stars, like that they would put on the background. Mm-hmm. They added a star in the middle, of, like a sun that had gravity to it and, and Newtonian physics around it, which is actually really impressive. That's you crazy. It, like, they could do physics. that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you could there was there were strategies where you would like use the sun to sort of launch yourself around. Um, they added a hyperspace button. Which is where you would press it, and you would just end up somewhere on the map, random. <laughs> Which I thought was cool. Sometimes it would be too close to the sun, and you would get sucked in. And then sometimes you wouldn't. That's so cool. But it was a nice uh, uh, last ditch effort. If you needed a quick eject, mm-hmm. get me out of here. You could take a chance and launch yourself across. The and map. we, I mean, we watched it, and it looked pretty cool. Like that, you yeah. had you had getting would shoot torpedoes at the other team, which were just like little lines. That would, and the torpedoes actually would cancel each other out if they touched, which I thought mm-hmm. was interesting. Yeah, they would actually blow each other up. So there was like defense to it too. They, as in the TMRC, also invented a gamepad for the game. Because like, a, like a customized... Like a customized controller. They were the first ones, as far as we know, to make like a real controller for the game. It was like a remote control that had buttons for each movement. Yeah. They would plug it into the computer, and then you could play on that. Because in the book, it said they would have to lean into the computer, and their elbow would start to hurt after a oh, while. Oh, because they had to like operate the switches manually yeah, on the computer. Yeah, and then their elbow would get sore, so they made this gamepad so they could play for longer, which... Is awesome. Mm-hmm. I bought game pads so that I could play for longer. You like did. Specifically, I bought this one so that I can play it longer kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. It's great. I think it's 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 really cool. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about with them is this was, this was I guess, called the... Oh, actually, no. We got to say this real quick before I move on to the next thing. Mm. And that is, this game was not for sale. Yeah. Space War was never sold. It was actually just made for the sake of making it because they loved computers so much. Mm-hmm. And then Digital Equipment took the game for free and they put it on all of their computers and it's now like a demo, a tech demo for it. When mm. they would sell their computers, it would come with your P- it would come with your PDP computer and you had that as a game to try out and demo like a diagnostic tool to it to see everything was working properly. That's pretty cool. And but- it's 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 a good uh, way to immediately sell somebody a thing like, "Hey, this is a really cool computer. I know it's the size of a car. I know it's going to require a whole lot of refrigeration, but you want to do it because you want to play Space War. Yeah, you want to play Space War for $120,000. <laughs> 120, $120,000, $1968. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this, um, this is what I was going to get to. I didn't want to skip ahead of the free demo thing, mm. but um, this was credited as being the first game. But in the book, there's a little star, and you go down, and Tennis for Two in 1958 created by Willie Higginbotham, which is an amazing name. Mm-hmm. He People credit him as the first game because mm. he made it on an oscilloscope. Oscilloscope? Oscilloscope. 
Yeah, which yeah. I don't really know. What's an oscilloscope, Tyler? It's, sort of, it's just a, an instrument that, that reads like electronic waves, waves kind of. And so um, you can you could kind of program them. They're sort of a rudimentary like screen that could be programmed. Is it like when in high school kids would play games on their TI-83 graphing calculator? Kind of, only those used LCDs. <laughs> very, very similar. Very similar. <laughs> Tyler's here for all the tech needs. I'm just here to make <laughs> dumb analogies. <laughs> That's it for the MIT. It's, it's more like playing a game on a on like a hospital's like heart monitor. Oh, okay. It's That's more better. like programming the heart monitor to have a game on it. <laughs> that would be interesting. Yeah. And make nurses mad. Yep. Um, chapter two. For us, this is like the well. We were in chapter two of the book, but this is the second part of chapter two. This is on Magnavox. Magnavox they... and the Odyssey. Magnavox presents Odyssey, the electronic game of the future. The Magnavox Odyssey. If we start here, is the first like home video game console that was marketed to consumers for people to play games and have fun on their TVs at home. Um, so that's obviously very significant uh, because video games previously had only been like in bars and stuff and like a social experience experience like outside of the house the odyssey was uh small enough which is very important and cheap enough that people could keep them in their homes nice so that's the the that's the significance of the odyssey yeah. I guess. and it actually started at a defense company like a defense mm. contractor called sanders associates mm-hmm. and in the equipment design division ralph bear b-a-e-r and he was the one that he came up with the idea. He kept meticulous notes. Like he, kept, he always like archived and kept notes of everything. And he was at a bus station in New York when he thought of the idea to have a game system for televisions for nineteen dollars and ninety five cents. Wow, what a cheap game system! Yeah, what a good guy. Like I want to sell a game system that's affordable that just cooks up to your TV for that amount of money for twenty bucks. And I remember in the uh, book, he had a big staff with a really big budget. And he just decided he wanted to do this. So he pulled like five or six people away and was like, you guys are going to work on this now and we're not going to tell anyone about it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not going to look at the budget at all. It won't affect it at all. Like no one's going to notice or care. So mm-hmm. just work on this. And the first person he got as a game designer was Bill Harrison. And he was good at transistor circuit systems, which I have no idea what that means. Just like building electronics and stuff. No. Uh, transistors. Oh, okay, cool. And, uh, and he was... Uh, he, it's funny because this is around the time too where his boss, Ralph Bear's boss, wanted to shut it down. Uh, or no, the board wanted to shut it down. Mm-hmm. But Ralph Bear's boss would come down and check on their progress and they made like a shooting gallery game and his boss loved it so much he just pushed to keep the project going because they would go to play shooting gallery downstairs. <laughs> that's crazy. The the amount of times along the way here where any where like these projects could have just been shut down like super early mm-hmm. is funny. And it's all just because some dude was like, oh, this is a really fun shooting game. Yeah, we should just yeah. keep this going. Why it's not? all because some dude could nail a pinball thing in the middle of court. Yeah, <laughs> so you might as well keep going. Yeah. <laughs> the next person Ralph Bear hired was Bill Rush, and he was an engineer in the R&D department, and he moved over. And while in the book it says he was very hard to motivate, did you read that part where it was like he came in at like 11 o'clock a.m. every day and everyone's like, come on, dude, Bill, you're killing me. Bill, you're, you're just, you know. <laughs> he came up with the idea to make it ping pong hmm. and table tennis. Okay. And then eventually ice hockey because they would just make the screen blue and they oh. made the goals in the back instead of just the Beside. wall. Yeah. yeah. So it was just they made it into ice hockey. They just reskinned it, which I thought was pretty funny. Nice. Yeah. So it's pretty, I mean... And then this game, do you want to keep talking about the game and who they, how they tried to sell it? Yeah, well, they first they tried to sell it to General Electric. They tried to sell it to Zenith. They tried to sell it to Sylvania, all these TV manufacturers. Um, they eventually did get Magnavox on board to sell it, which is pretty crazy. Actually, in, in, in some of the advertisements for it, they didn't make it clear that it, this could be used with any television. And so it kind of appeared like you needed a Magnavox television, which I'm sure Magnavox was super stoked on because they were like, yeah, sure, people yeah. want this, they need to buy our TV, right? But the it was actually kind of a turnoff for consumers because back in the day you only had one tv in your house yeah and if you already had a tv you weren't about to go buy another tv for any reason and so if you thought you needed a magnavox tv and you didn't have one you didn't buy a. there's so many i remember this being uh that show f is for family on netflix they have a big episode about how they got a color tv to watch a boxing match and it was Mm. a big deal yeah (laughs) like yeah that's funny because yeah the I wonder if the salesmen in like TV stores were like, "Hey, you can buy this for any TV." 
probably. Like, because they knew, right? But I bet there's a lot of them that didn't because I'm they in the TV s- store and they don't always know what's going on. Yeah, and they're like, I want to get sell you this other TV and this like, thing. But you look know? at the pixels on this one. Like, <laughs> like they all have pixels. Yeah, but this one has pixels. <laughs> <laughs> These pixels don't run. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so okay, the it was shipped in 1972. Mm-hmm. Right? That's when it first started. And how much did they end up selling it for? Well, remember, he wanted to sell it for nineteen ninety five, which is about $120 in today's dollar count. And what they ended up selling it for was $100 in 1972 dollars, which is roughly $600 today. <laughs> $600. $600. That's like, uh, remember the first the first models of PlayStation 3? The good <laughs> one was 600 bucks. That was 600 bucks. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, the one with the 60 gig hard drive and the Wi-Fi. It had Wi-Fi built in. Whoa. Not the, not the Odyssey, PlayStation 3. Wasn't... Wasn't it? Which, which one is? Isn't PlayStation Two the greatest selling console of all time? Uh, what didn't that have the the record? It depends on the the metric you're looking at. I think I think the Wii holds it. The, the Wii does the the record for like number of like most units sold. But the PS Two is right up there. Oh yeah, because the Wii had like just adults like yeah way more adults buy it than just kids yeah, yeah. people bought it to play three rounds of Wii tennis and, and we fit it, and it just cut collected dust i stood on a Wii fit platform one time and it told me i was off balance and that my gait was all messed up and i'm oh. like i don't need you nintendo Wii, to tell me what to do <laughs> and then i walked away from it <laughs> and then i found five dollars yeah so that's pretty much it for the magnavox odyssey yeah uh one of the cool things i think about well, not necessarily cool things, but one of the uh, more interesting things about the uh, the Odyssey, I think, is it had little cartridges that would plug into it to like choose the game you wanted to play. But that's really all it was. It was to choose the game. The cartridge itself didn't have the game on it. They would oh. just it, it just couldn't made the right connections inside the machine to to load the game. Oh, like, all the games were built in, so you couldn't buy more games for the Odyssey because they were all loaded in there, and you just and it came with all the games. And so you the just cartridge just unlocked it essentially. Yeah. So if you lost the cartridge you could be like hey you got the cartridge for that game right can you just bring it over and yeah. plug it in? it would just unlock yeah, it or you could you. just like carve your own basically out oh. of like metal. Like, i don't know if people did that probably but like that would work like you just had to make the right connections in the thing that's so funny because people probably thought oh the game's on here i'm going to share it with my friend when really it's just unlocking a yeah. piece of your it's like when developers ship a game and the DLC is already on the disc and they just don't have it unlocked. You get yep. really mad. That's yep. fun. It's like when you install a game on your Xbox and you're playing the game off your Xbox, but you still have to put the disc in. Oh, that's the worst. Yeah. It happened to me recently. It was really, it was really with Grand Theft Auto V. Yep. I was like bummed out about it. So these two are like in the book, Ralph Bear mm-hmm. and Stephen Harrison. Mm-hmm. The Bill guy, Harrison. Bill Harrison. Sorry. I'm just going to make up names as I go along. Freaking idiot. Uh, Bill Harrison, they're considered the forgotten fathers of the video game industry because Space War was on a super expensive computer that no one really had. And then Odyssey was expensive and it was poorly advertised and it got overshadowed by the next thing we're going to talk about next episode. Cliffhangers. Are you Sylvester Stallone? Are you cliffhangering right now? I'm hanging by this cliff so hard. (laughs) <laughs> but now we get to go into my favorite segment and that is what you play in this week oh what you playing this week what you play in this week you want me to go first yeah i have been playing a lot of player unknowns battlegrounds i got the game you warned me i warned you because about... you're a good friend and you were like hey mike i want to let you know you're gonna get on next box and it's gonna be bugged out and i'm like you're right tyler i'm not gonna get it i'm gonna wait and then it was late one night and I'm sitting there, and my friend's texting me like, I'm having so much fun on PUBG. You got to get on this thing. Get that late night text. And I was like, oh, man, I know how the hotline bling. Mm-hmm. And then I downloaded it immediately, you know? And I played it, and it was really laggy, but it was really fun. Like, it gave me, like, that nervous pit in my stomach yeah. when I'm playing. Like, mm-hmm. it gives me, like, the nerves and anxiety that I'm addicted to with games that I don't really get anymore. There's a certain, a certain uh, like the anticipation that it builds, and I, I think it's uh, really interesting how every game you play of PUBG sort of tells a story, right? You drop yeah. in, you don't necessarily know where you're going to drop in. You drop in, you land, and now you got to scavenge for things. So based on what you find, sort of changes the narrative of what happens yeah. in that game, right? That happened. Yeah, that's. I remember because my friend and I, we dropped in and we couldn't find anything and every building we ran into had people that started shooting at us <laughs> and so we did this for like three buildings and then eventually we had like a shotgun and a, each had an smg and we came across a building where two duos were fighting each other 
and one duo won, and I'm like, dude, let's just rush them. And then we went in and we killed the guys, and then we had way too much loot. Like we had way more than we needed. But that's like the little things that happen. And then we, I think we got in the top ten, but it was just like we didn't even win. But that game stands out because of how hard the start was. Yeah. Yeah, and it's so easy to just pick up, like, when you die, you just queue up again, you play again. It doesn't feel bad to die, usually, unless you, like, think you're about to win. Exactly. Once you start to think you have a shot at winning, that's when it starts to get really tense and mm-hmm. it starts to feel bad when you lose. But you know. well, I was telling my friend that, that I don't feel bad about losing right away, yeah. and I don't feel bad about losing in the top 10. I feel bad when I'm, like, halfway through the game and there's, like, 50 people left, and I just can't find anything, and I just get shot, out yeah. of, like, sniped out of nowhere. That's what bothers That's me. That's what bugs me, too. Yeah, but it's, like, I'd rather lose immediately and re or play and to get, like, fifth place or something. That's yeah. what I feel like. But yeah. what have you been playing this week? Uh, this week, I've been playing, uh, and similar to the PUBG, I've been playing Fortnite, but I've been playing the mobile version. Ooh. Um, I got into the, the beta for the mobile version, which uh, plays surprisingly well. It's... Uh, it's the full game, the full Battle Royale experience. Like, all of your progression from if you're playing on Xbox, if you're playing on PC, like, all that progression transfers over. Um, everything about it, it's all the same guns, all the same weapons, it's the same map. You could even queue up and play with your friends on other consoles. So it's just, it's the full game. But on mobile specifically, it's got it's got kind of a weird control scheme because, like, touchscreens are weird. And so when you're playing by, by yourself with other mobile people, when you run into another person, there's, like, this moment where you see this other person, you know they see you. But because the controls are so awkward, we got to take a second here. We got to like turn around, do 10 paces because like we're aiming for each other now. Yeah. <laughs> and it takes a minute. And it's whoever can get their crosshairs aimed first uh, wins the fight usually. And, and, and it's 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 not awesome, but it does scratch that itch. Like if you're sitting in an airport or something and you wanted to play a Fortnite or a PUBG type game and you wanted that full experience, you can get it playing it on your phone. Yeah. Um, if you queue up with your friends on console or on PC – you're going to have a bad time because you're going to end up playing against other people on console PC. And... So, But you know what that means? If you play it on a phone and you're playing against people on console and PC and you kill someone, congrats, you're the best Fortnite player that ever lived. <laughs> That's what that means. <laughs> yeah. It's a challenge. It should be an achievement. I guess. Like should... kill, a, kill a person on another platform. If, kill a, yeah, if you're on iPhone and you kill someone on PC, you should get like a trophy or something <laughs> or like a hat. I don't know. Yeah. Um, we were talking about that at the sandwich shop about how... Um, uh, battle royale games like people think they're gonna go to third like another like another, more games like triple a titles and mm-hmm. stuff what do you want to see battle royale mode on what game oh if i had a choice of like what game to see a battle royale mode on uh i mean battlefield battlefield would Battlefield's be dope. pretty good that that seems to, it seems to lend itself well to that um there's a there's like a small part of me that wants to see like a Persona Battle Royale, Ooh. which is basically. Did you ever watch the movie Battle Royale, which is what all these yeah. games are based off of? Yeah, that's basically what that movie is. Is Persona Battle Royale? Really? Because it's like a bunch of like kids in like a Japanese school, and like so they're all in their like uniforms, and like it looks like Persona Battle Royale. I just remember when Hunger Games people came out like, oh, it's just stealing Battle Royale, and I'm yeah. like, eh, it's a book, but it's fine, whatever. I get, I'll take where you're going from. Yeah, Battle you know, Royale was a book too. You know what I was thinking about? What but, were you thinking about? I was thinking about a good game would be um, that, and it's, I don't, I don't know how, I think they could do it. Far Cry. Oh, yeah. Far Cry would be a great thing for a Battle Royale game, right? I, I think I agree with that, yeah. And I was even thinking how cool it would be if it was like Far Cry Primal. Hmm. Like, I know that game wasn't very popular, but I think it's got like different, it's different, you know? Yeah. Or like even like a game like, and this is a like deep PC poll that's funny because I've actually never played the game, but I've watched a lot of videos on it, is Chivalry. Mm. like the medieval a medieval battle royale with yeah. like melee weapons only that would be melee like crazy only. that would be neat yeah but I, it's it's, it's kind of cool it's like a game mode that's new so it's exciting and mm-hmm. i feel like it's going to go to other platforms it'll be fun yeah it reminds me of the the moba genre circa like 2008 2009 yeah. or like 2009 2010 when all like all these other games started coming out and like some of them were good some of them were not so good but that was the hot mode and that's what battle royale is right now yeah it's the hot mode and it's fun so this is good. This is good. I, this was great. I'm happy with this first episode. Yeah, I feel alive. I feel like it's a beautiful pilot. Mm-hmm. I think we're going to sell it to like Fox. Yeah. Or NBC yeah. or somebody. Maybe we'll sell it to GE, Zenith, GE. Sylvania. <laughs> Magnavox will pick us up for sure. I told them I want to put it up for 1995 an episode. We'll see what they put it as. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah, do you have any uh, social media you want to plug or anything no. like that? I don't have anything uh, people can find me on. All right. You can't find Tyler, but you can find me on Twitter at me, Coletta, M E C O L E T T A. And you can tweet me what you want me to tell Tyler and I'll tell him. Yeah. Does that work? There you go. That'll work. All right, cool. This was great, Tyler. Do you want to say bye to everybody? Bye, everybody.
Hey, everyone. Just want to let you know we do have an email now. It's codexhistorypodcast at gmail.com. Once again, that's codexhistorypodcast at gmail.com. Thanks, and we'll see you next week. This has been a Potaholics Comedy Network presentation. Potaholics.com.